last left off, we were doing these things, right? That was so scary. Can we watch the rest of them? Oh, yeah. See that. Yeah, we watched them. I slapped myself in the face. That was funny. The scorpion fish is almost perfectly camouflaged against the colorful coralline rock. He is an ambush predator. It was the last one, I think, that we didn't we finish. We, yeah, we, we the didn't finish that. The octopus has decided to leave his den and search for a meal. He's a master of camouflage, but his cryptic colors are not so effective when he's on the move. And nearby, a very hungry and well camouflaged scorpion fish has prepared another ambush.
longer than it is wide and wriggles near a fish in an American river. What else could it be? Except, perhaps, the tongue of a snapping turtle. Um, 
uh, an organism, a, 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 a bird living in a tr in a hole in a tree. The tree's got the hole in it anyway. A fungus grew inside the tree and ate a, ate a dead area of the tree out. And so there's a, just an opening in a tree and a bird just lives in that hole and it doesn't really help the tree any. It doesn't really hurt the tree any. The tree's not really doing anything. But it helps the bird. So that's a that's called commensalism. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say like cooks fish that like stick to sharks. Great example. Great example. Yeah. The fish are kind of stick, sticking to the shark. The shark it doesn't really help the shark. It doesn't really hurt it. It's not like really, it's real heavy or anything. Why so that's a commensalistic. Well, but why do they stick to the shark? They stick to the shark because sharks are kind of messy eaters. Oh, yeah. And so after the shark, shark's eating something, all this stuff's flying out, and they'll jump off and grab the little bits and pieces. And then nothing's going to mess with them because they're, they're stuck to a shark. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And the shark so, knows they're there. Most... Uh, yeah, it may, but it can't really do anything about it because it doesn't have arms or something to grab them off. And it's not hurting the shark, so it just leaves it alone. Mutualism is when there are two species and they're both benefiting. So what kind of relationship would we call that? Plus, plus. That's a plus, plus. You have bacteria living in your intestine right now. And they're going along, and they help you. They make vitamins for you. B and K. B and K. Yeah. And what what do you do for them? You give them a place to live. You give them a little bit of food that you can't digest anyway. And you're both benefiting. So that's a plus-plus relationship. Lots of relationships in nature, and they all fall under one of those three categories. She watched Monsters and Psychic. Oh, yeah, right. Parasites and, There's uh, a parasitic heartworm. Have you ever heard of heartworms? Mm -hmm. Dogs get them. My first dog died of heartworms. Wow. So those worms develop and they... they what, what, what is that one? Which one of these three? Plus minus. Uh, yeah, plus minus. Which is called what? Parasitism. Parasitism. So what, what does that do, basically? Kills the... I mean... They, so, they eat so the blood of the... Of the dog. And doesn't it get to where so many start growing in there just like bursts? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So what does the immune system do about that? Well, it tries to kill them, but often the the infection overwhelms the dog, especially if the dog gets sick or something from something else. Um. Is there medicine for heartworm now, like mm -hmm. warming and stuff like that? Oh yeah. It's treatable now. Yeah, it's treatable. But it wasn't. You had a dog that was. This? What's that? When you had your dog. No, there's me there's medicine then, but it, it can get where it's so so bad yeah. that you can't treat it. Yeah. So you got to catch it early. Uh -huh. Then th this is a uh, relationship: the clownfish and the sea anemone. Remember that? Mutualism. Is that mutual? What is that? No, that's, uh, that's mutualism. Mutualism. Or mutualistic. The book shows an example of, of commensalism, but I guess you can think of it as mutualism. As the, the clownfish is benefiting getting a place to live and getting protection, but if something comes after the clownfish and gets stuck in the sea anemone, and then the anemone eats that, then it would be benefiting, wouldn't it? So sometimes that happens. So What's you could probably think of it as either one of those. Wait, why doesn't it eat the clownfish? The clownfish is immune to its sting, it so it can't kill it. Or do we know how it is, or is it just... In finding emails, uh, it's got some uh, a layer of a tough layer of skin or something that protects it. I'm not really sure if it's good for it. Did it evolve to do that or just yeah, it evolved that like specifically for that purpose, or is it just something else? No, probably for that purpose. Right. Yeah. I mean, the ones that had thicker skin and didn't get stung could live there and not get yeah. eaten. They eventually all got to be that way. Here's a little symbiosis video. Symbiotic relationships include mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Mutualism exists between these birds and giraffes. The birds eat the parasitic insects on the giraffe's body. The giraffe is relieved of annoying pests. Commensalism is seen in clownfishes that live safely among the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone where they are protected from predators. Leeches are parasites, 
They depend entirely on another organism for their food. Gross. What example is leech? A leech is a parasite. Though if you have like bad blood, I guess it could be mutualistic. But it's not the best way to do it. Yeah, if, if you were using a doctor's leech, but yeah. we're usually talking about it in nature here. Mutualism can take many forms, such as when birds like Clark's nutcrackers feed on but also dispense the seeds of white bark pine trees. So it's helping them by spreading the seeds. This is pretty cool. This is the acacia tree. Have you ever heard of that? The acacia trees live in um, uh, Africa and kind of in, um, in the savannas, and they have ants living with them that help them. That's what this video is about. In Africa, there are a great number of very determined plant eaters. Acacias protect themselves with spines, but they're by no means a total defense. Some animals, it's true, are put off by them, but others, like the giraffe, seem able to ignore them. Oh, 
bones go down the trunk and range for a long way over the surrounding earth. Hmm. Seedlings that sprout within this area, so threatening to take some of the acacia's sustenance, are severely mourned. The ants aren't eating this plant, they're chewing it to death. Oh. But some I haven't some evolved to like recognize them and like kill Maybe kill the eggs too. Probably some have yeah. There's all sorts of different uh, huh. different species out there, so I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of variation. Okay, section 45.2, page 868, talks about what we call ecological succession. It's how a community changes over time. And here we have a field that has just been uh, cleaned of all its crops and it's just left alone. And here's a year later what it looks like. And then if you go another few years, here's what it looks like. 10 years later, 20 years later, you can see what's happening. The community is getting more and more. It's getting larger. It's having more different types of species on it. It's getting more diverse is what we said. And we call this whole process of going to just a few small species to a lot of large species, we call it ecological succession. That's a term you need to know. Ecological succession. And what we say is that there's a greater and greater diversity of species, more different types of species, as the organisms get larger, they're able to harbor more insects and such that can eat the plants, animals that can live in the forests. And there's not just one, all that shows these pine trees, there's obviously probably a lot of stuff living on the ground too. There's bushes and stuff in there that can survive at low light levels, ferns and such. So you start with a few species, grasses, and we call these early species the pioneer species, the first organisms in an area. It's usually lichens, a very simple uh, algae or something like that. And then later grasses come in, and then shrubs, and then trees. The final type of community at which there's the most different types of species, the highest biodiversity, we call that the climax community. The climax community has the most different types of organisms. So you start with the pioneer species and you end with the climax community. We call that ecological succession. Um, I think this is a real bad video. Yeah, this video is pretty bad. Now, there's two types of succession we run into. There's primary succession, and there's secondary succession. Secondary. 
Primary succession is growth of a community when there's nothing to start with. No soil, no other plants, no nothing. For instance, a volcanic island comes up out of the ocean produced by volcanoes and you're just left with rock. To develop a community on that, we call that primary succession. Or let's say they build a, a big mall, a big strip mall, and it all goes broke like the one up in Darien is doing, and you're just left with concrete. And you just leave that there, how long would it take for a forest to develop over that concrete? That's primary succession. It's usually on the order of hundreds of years. Now, secondary succession is when you have, like, you already have soil, like a fire comes through, or like they've been growing crops, and you already have the dirt there. And then you still have to go through this process, but it goes a lot faster, you see, if you already have the soil. So primary succession is no soil. Secondary succession is already soil. Secondary is a lot faster. This might take 100 years, whereas this might take 500 years. And so there's a whole section on succession there that you should read. It's only two pages, page 868 and 869. Now finally, 870. 870 talks about how energy flows through a community. And in a community, you basically have four different classifications of organisms. First, you have your producers. The producers do photosynthesis and make food from scratch. We're talking about the algae and the plants and even the cyanobacteria that can make their own food. Those are the producers. Hopefully, you've heard these words before. The herbivores are the organisms that eat the producers. So here a caterpillar is eating a, a leaf and a bunny there is eating a little flower. Those are herbivores because they eat the producers. Then you have the carnivores, they eat the herbivores. All carnivores are eating other animals and such. And then all three of these levels, when they die, they're decomposed. Their bodies are decomposed, and the molecules in their bodies are returned to the soil, and the energy in their bodies goes to the bodies of the decomposers and helps them survive. Decomposers are mostly uh, bacteria and fungi. that They do most of the decomposition. So always, every level ends up being consumed by a decomposer. And these are the different levels of what we call the food chain. You ever heard of a food chain before? Mm -hmm. Are you with me over there, Elena? Yes. Energy comes in from the sun, usually. It's picked up by the producers. The energy's taken in and used to make food. Used to bond together those carbon dioxide molecules and bond them together to form a ring of carbons. Do y'all remember what we call a simple carbon ring? We have a name for it. Saccharide. Monosaccharide. Monosaccharide. Like, can you give me an example? Glucose. Glucose. Simple sugar. And it takes the sun's energy, the plant will put that glucose together, you see. And there are those, the producers, and then during the lives of, of the organism, some of the energy is used and lost usually is heat. Feel your feel your face right now. Is it warm? Mm -hmm. Ah, there's heat coming off of you right now. That heat was originally energy from the sun. And you ate the plants, you see. You ate the producers or you ate animals that ate the plants. You're a consumer, so you ate the producers. Or you ate other animals that ate the producers, and anyway, you're getting the energy. It's going into you. 
Some of it comes off of you as heat. The rest of it goes to the next level. Now, if you got eaten by a lion or something, it would go into the lion's body. But you probably won't get eaten by a lion. So what's going to end up eating you? Very nice, you can. <coughs> the decomposers end up eating you. So all the energy that originally goes into organisms is eventually lost from organisms as heat. It's kind of interesting. I like to think of the world like this. We have our, uh, on, on a, a normal planet like Mars or something, the light comes in, it bounces off the planet, heats it up a little bit, and goes right off. On our planet, the energy comes in, and it's used by organisms to fuel themselves and have them run around and use the energy. And Most of the energy comes off as heat. And if you looked at the planet from a distance as an alien, you kind of looked at this planet, you'd see all these little creatures running around using the sun's energy. A planet like Mars doesn't have that, but our planet does. Life. It's real cool. That's how you work, from the sun's energy. You're part of the dissipation of the sun's energy. You're part of that process. Take a summer. This inorganic nutrient pool is all the, all the um, nutrients from the organisms are left in the soil and they can reform the organisms to begin with. Huh. And that's this arrow going back here. So read, read all the way through the first couple pages of 45.3 and then uh, we'll do um, cycles next time. Okay.